All right, everyone, welcome to episode 10 now of the Backyard Banter podcast. My name is Matt Harmon. You know me from NFL.com, Reception Perception, uh, and clogging your timeline with a bunch of terrible tweets. Uh, So we're here today with a great guest, um, our first female guest on the podcast. It's Liz Loza from Yahoo Sports. Liz, how are you doing today? I am great. We just had a wonderful Easter weekend. Actually, Easter, I am not a particularly religious person, but Easter is my favorite holiday because spring is my favorite season. So it was a fantastic day of gathering organic jelly beans because I live in Los Angeles, so we can't use that Brock (laughs) stuff. Um, And um, yeah, and just going on like a million egg hunts. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you have you have a kid and everything, so it's probably a different experience than my Easter was. This was this was my first one. You know, obviously now I live on the West Coast, all my family's back on the East Coast, so this mm-hmm. was my first Easter as a transplant. And um, Alex Gelhar, my roommate here and NFL.com coworker, like he has a big group of friends that all get together and they have these annual Mario Kart tournaments. And I'm, I saw that on Twitter. Very cool. I am furious to report that I got in second place. Obviously, oh. yeah, it was a big letdown. I got a lot of feelings about it. And I probably should just stop talking about it right now, or I'm going to clog the whole hour literally talking about Mario Kart. But um, so we'll, we'll just move on. Who did getting... you get to drive though? Because I feel like that's super key. Bowser. See, and this is oh. this, um, it's a, it's a contrarian take though because I always I always use Bowser and everybody like the worst part about it is like you know you tweet that you you drive with Bowser and like you get all the Yoshi and Toad truthers in your mentions and then yes, the fact- I was just going to say Yoshi's the way to go. Oh, Yoshi's trash. He's a bad character. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm a big guy myself, uh, and I like to play as one of the big guys and bully the hell out of the little people. I mean, that's I don't do that in real life, but in Mario Kart, that's how things have to be. So I don't know. I do think it's I do think it says a lot about you and, and the fact that Toad ended up winning, like the some the guy that played as Toad was that was probably the most heartbreaking thing about it, because then I had to go back on Twitter. Obviously, egotistically live tweeting about it the entire time. I'd go back and report that I lost to Toad and that was bad. That's so interesting that Bowser is your alter ego because I always play Yoshi, but my favorite character is to play Toad. And I think that's cause like, I'm kind of small and an underdog. So antithetical well, yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, and I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I it's as somebody said that I, I play as Derrick Henry basically because I'm big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm big I bully people around and but you know those big guys when they hit top speed it's good and that is basically and I was like wow that actually is very accurate both to the character Bowser and Derrick Henry so that's I guess that does say a lot about me I don't know I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm ready to delve into the psychology of my Mario Kart character choices but yeah Mario Kart's great you could I could literally talk for hours I've played so much Mario Kart in my stupid young life but um anyways let's steer the conversation back to you because this, <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is supposed to be about the guest um so Liz I always ask everybody first question on the podcast like how did you first, you know, kind of fall in love with football or, or fantasy sports in general? Let's let's start at that point of your story. Yeah, well, this is kind of, um, I feel like a lot of people in this business um, and who end up with making this uh, a hobby, it's a little circuitous route with quite a few detours. But I think it began, if you want to lay down on the couch, Dr. Harmon, um, it began <laughs> when I was a little girl. Um, so I was raised by a single mom. And my grandfather was my primary caregiver because my mom was out working, you know, trying to put food on the table and my grandfather was retired. So he um, was the guy who was in charge of everything from Halloween costumes to shuttling me to ice skating lessons and ballet recitals and all of it. Um, And as a result, I was the only child. I learned everything that if we're speaking in gender normative terms, which I try not to do, but is applicable in this case, um, I learned what a boy would learn. So I learned how to diagnose a faulty belt on a washing machine. I learned how to, my first car, I learned how to drive stick shift. I know how to drive stick shift because there was a World War II vet who was teaching me about life. And so a lot of that came, uh, sports became a large part of that. My grandfather was originally from Chicago, um, a Southsider, but a convert and Cubs fan. And so we watched a ton of sports together. I was out, I I didn't play tennis because we weren't rich. Um, (laughs) golf wasn't part of like the equation. I didn't under, I didn't even know that like lacrosse was a thing until I got to college. Um, but there was a lot of like softball, baseball, 
t-ball, football. I was a figure skater, hockey, um, and he was taking me to all those things. So uh, sports was never this like foreign thing that only boys played in my world at all. So it's very normal. And I think Chicago, where I grew up, is also um, a pretty big sports town. So it was, there wasn't this gender divide um, as I've experienced since getting into the industry. Um, and just anecdotally, I think this perfectly sums up my childhood. But it was third grade. It was Halloween. My grandfather's in charge of the Halloween costume because my mom was working. And he said, all right, babe, what do you want to, what do you want to be for Halloween? And I chose to be Ryan Sandberg, the second baseman for the Chicago Cubs. All the other little girls are princesses. I had you know, blackout under my eyes. My grandpa had duct taped a two and a three on the back of some Cubs t-shirt and that's who I was for Halloween. So um, that I was really into and passionate about sports because I just wanted to do anything that could please him. That would make me, you know, that would make my grandfather proud of me. And sports was something that he placed a lot, a great deal of pride into and on. So fast forward a bunch of years, I go to college He uh, in my freshman year of college very unfortunately passed away and I wasn't home. I didn't get home. I went to college in Rhode Island. I didn't get home in time to say goodbye. And I was absolutely heartbroken. It was December. The Bears were playing the Vikings. And as a way to grieve, I didn't know what to do. So I just sat down and watched, which was not particularly weird, but I watched the entire Bears-Vikings game. And then I watched the next game that was on TV. And then I just started watching every single football game as a way to grieve and deal with this and sort of have my solace about it. And that tradition stuck. Obviously, December, end of the regular season, I did it throughout the playoffs and the Super Bowl. And then the guys across the hall from me back in college were watching games. They had a better TV than I had, so I'd watch the games with them. And I just kept doing that. Fast forward a bunch of years again, dating this guy. He's in this thing called a fantasy football league. I have no idea what it was, but he asked me, hey, do you mind if on Sunday, like I, I'm in this fantasy league and I want to watch football all day. And I was like, aces, that's sort of my plan on Sundays <laughs> anyway. Um, and he was, I was like, I didn't know if you'd be cool with that. So I haven't really said anything, but it's like one of the first, some, like one of our first Sunday dates. Um, and he was like, wait, wait, you're literally okay with just sitting on the sofa and watching football all day. I have this thing called the red zone channel. And I was like, that's cool. I can't afford the red zone channel. Like let's sit at your place and do this all day. <laughs> Um, we'll get chicken wings and it'll be amazing. And I didn't know that he was, I didn't understand that he wanted to watch. I was just watching these games because this was what I did. And I was interested in the league. I had no idea that fantasy sports was a thing and there were implications involved, personal implications for him, individual implications. So he starts explaining to me this fantasy football team and why he's watching certain games more than other games. And I'm catching on pretty quickly. And then as the season goes along, he starts asking me for advice. You know, and he's like, well, what do you think of MJD here? What do you, you know, um, what do you think of Donovan McNabb, Brian Westbrook, like these guys? And I started managing his team. And wouldn't you know it, I managed his team all the way to a Super Bowl victory. And I thought, yeah. F this, like, I want my own <laughs> team. Like, I am totally hooked. This is the most amazing. This is like combines what I'm already doing into something individual. Um, and I can have some self-participation in it. So... Um, there happened to be an opening in that league. I took the spot. I won the Super Bowl my first year in. All the guys balked, said it was beginner's luck. I won the Super Bowl the second year in a row. And uh, then I was completely hooked and just I started the fantasyfootballgirl.com, which was my blog, and it all sort of snowballed from there. I'm sure that was a real treat for, for all those all the homeboys in that league to, to lose two, <laughs> two times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of three seasons in a row, you know. Oh well, all right. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez, yeah, that's always a. I don't think I've actually ever played. Well, well, that like uh, in a home league in which I knew uh, like that a female was in the league. So that's interesting. I don't know, and you know, I don't. I don't tend to be somebody that cares particularly, but I would imagine that of several of my idiot friends that uh, that I still talk to would have some stupid things to say about that. But. Um, uh, so okay, we'll, we'll we'll go from kind of the uh, the you know the, that story there. So you said you started your own blog. What kind of was the impetus to start getting your own thoughts out there? Well, I would just I was just so enamored with the fan. Like I couldn't believe that after I don't know a decade less than that, maybe five years of watching all like not just watching Bears games, but watching all of these football games. I couldn't believe that I could like 
participate in an individual way. And I was completely enamored with that because I'd already been doing all of this stuff for no personal gain, you know? Right. Um, and I love the idea. I'm kind of a dork. So I love the like choose your own adventure plus sports. Like this is the perfect combination of like things that I was geekily passionate about. So I wanted to learn more about it. And I felt like there weren't a ton of, this was uh, 2009, I want to say. There weren't like a ton of options out there. And I did not have cable at my own apartment because I couldn't afford it. And so I like just had the internet and I felt like the internet, there wasn't, there wasn't enough information. And so I wanted to start this blog just as a way to engage with other people who are into this like super niche random thing. And at the time I was working fairly successfully, though not successfully so much that I could afford cable television, <laughs> but, but this Success is, pretty, is all relative <laughs> pre Netflix, you know, um, I, um, I was working as an actress and I was working pretty steadily. It's what I had come out to LA to do. Um, you know, didn't necessarily need a day job that often, but the thing about acting that was kind of a bummer was as much as I loved telling stories and being a vessel for stories, I was a little reticent about the fact that they weren't my words. This wasn't my narrative. And starting the blog, even though you think like, oh, it's sports, like it's a choose your own adventure sports, which allows you to like create a story. You get to decide um, whether this using you know, statistics and facts, obviously, but you get to decide like whether you think this guy is going to break out, what this matchup looks like. And there's so much storytelling in that. And I totally ate it up. Um, so I just started the blog as a way to reach out and learn. I never planned on calling myself a fantasy football expert. I didn't even frankly know that that was a thing that you could call yourself an expert at something like this. Um, but I also felt like there weren't any women in this space. And I was shocked because I remember going to like like starting the blog and all of my friends, male and female, knew that I, you know, knew why and that I did watch the games all day Sunday. Um, and one of my girlfriends who was single, really successful, beautiful, runs marathons, television executive, owns her own place, which in Los Angeles is huge. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> you <know>? outrageous. <laughs> right? And she's like... And she was like, yeah, you know, I, I love the idea of sports, but I'm super intimidated because I don't want to sound dumb and I don't know a lot about it. And, and I just feel like I, if there was some place that I could ask questions without feeling like an idiot, like I could probably pull a ton at bars if I felt comfortable enough asking about this stuff. But I just sort of ignore it because I don't want to feel like an idiot. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, you own your own place. You're a television executive. You make major decisions for numerous people every day. This is this is like football. <laughs> this isn't rocket science, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's full of drama. And so I sort of felt like, as a woman, if I could be a safe place where other women could ask about this and not feel judged, then that was another beyond a selfish interest that I was creating for the blog. That's not to say that my blog was created for women. I never planned to like target a female audience, none of that. I, I didn't even really like plan to target any audience. I just wanted to start a blog and start engaging with other people and blogs were sort of the way to do it. Right. And that's what happened. And then I felt it catching steam, right? Like I felt Twitter followers engaging. I felt that there was an interest. I felt like there was a hunger and a passion and I was e-meeting people who were similarly obsessed <laughs> with this hobby. And so, I thought the next year, like, okay, expansion, like, how do I expand this? And I went on iTunes because podcasts were becoming quite a thing. And I went on iTunes and I just searched for fantasy football podcast and the fantasy football guys who still have a podcast, whose podcast I still appear on during football season once a week um, came up. And so did a bunch of other ones. They were in the first most downloaded independent podcast, number three overall behind CBS and ESPN at the time. And so I reached out to them and a bunch of other people and basically wrote a query letter saying, love the show, lots of great information. You're two white dudes droning on about sports and it's kind of boring. Mm. And if you give me a shot, I could probably spice things up or at least bring a different perspective. And all of the podcasts said no, podcast that I've now since been on, but <laughs> all the podcasts said no, except for the fantasy football guys who said, yes, please, let's chat. That's awesome. And they gave me a shot. 
and my numbers took off their numbers increased it was a win-win for everybody and then the year after that I started because um, I again every year it's like okay how do I expand like how do I grow like now I'm getting super into this what can I do to improve my game and also just you know delve into another piece of this landscape that I didn't know about before or that I wasn't as familiar with and so um, the year after that, I started the X's and Y's podcast with John Evans, on which you've been a guest. And then, you know, having your own podcast is a great learning experience. And we've been doing it, I don't know, four or five years now, four years. This is our fifth year, I think. Something like that. So yeah. I, I actually want to kind of, there's several points you made there that I want to get back to. First sure. of which being, and I don't know that we've like really hit on this at any point in the podcast, but it's something that I think is really important, at least in my, in my, in my opinion, and, and we'll see if you agree too, but you kind of mentioned like, you know, that, that idea of like being an actress and like you're telling stories, but it's not really your story. And like kind of, there's a bit of a, you know, a, Maybe this is, and I don't mean to say this with a negative connotation because I, I am the same way. So, and I'm certainly not talking negative about myself, but uh, like you mentioned like a selfish interest in like telling your own story. Like I kind of, I want to just like wrap on that for a little bit because I think that like be, having an ego and being self-assured, you know, like that might in some ways come off as a bad thing, but I think it's super important in this industry and like, you know, full disclosure, like Liz, you and I've met each other, like we both live in LA. I would, I would say I am a, I'm a very selfish person, probably borderline arrogant. And uh, I think you're very self, you seem like very self-confident as well. And I think that's an important thing to have in this, in this industry. So kind of want to just go back and forth. Like, do you agree with my, my sense on that or am I way off base? Oh, well, I don't think that there's anything selfish or arrogant about being confident. I mean, I, I think if you think you're better than other people, that's a very different thing than feeling like you have worked hard on yourself to be a good human being and have things that could benefit the world or other people. You know, like like when you go on a date, I'm I'm not I'm married now, but when I go when I used I to know, go I don't know what that is. <laughs> when I used to go on a date, like I was happy to be there. Right. And I would hope that the other person was happy to be there because otherwise that date wasn't going to go well. You know, like I'm not interested in talking to someone who isn't confident in their self. There's also, you know, not everybody is meant to be a broadcaster or a blogger or a professional writer. And that's totally fine. You know, <laughs> but there are some people who like want to tell stories, not necessarily my own story or your own story, but are interested in crafting narratives. And it's the oldest, or maybe second oldest, profession in history. <laughs> and so, I mean, like, like folklore and storytelling is completely natural. And so, to me, it's much more interesting. And like, as much as I appreciate, say, the metrics community, I, I am much more interested in saying like, okay, let's take this awesome data that they have culled and craft it into some sort of narrative so that is di so it is digestible for people reading it, which is something I think you do brilliantly with reception perception. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, once again, you've checked the box off. Every podcast guest has to compliment me at least once. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yeah, yeah you, you, thank you. I appreciate that. But I, I think that is really important. And, and there's a certain, you know, if you're not self, if you're not confident in yourself or self-assured or even like a little bit arrogant, like I think that, you won't, you won't hack it, I guess, in this, in this no, industry. Because not you, at all. You, yeah. Because the I mean, minute somebody have, says something awful about you, your whole, like, you can't let that bother you. I mean, yeah. the amount of nasty tweets that I get <laughs> are, are yeah. really special. So they're just, they're just special. Yeah. And we'll, we're definitely going to, to get into <laughs> that. Um, I, because even if it's not something nasty, like I've said a few times in the podcast, like I, I don't, I don't feel like I get a lot of, nastiness on Twitter and, and for whatever reason, one thing or another, but, I, but even somebody disagreeing with like your assessment, like you have to, even if it's in a, like in a totally like respectful, polite way, I think you have to like be able to sit there and take that and not take it personally either. Yeah. Like, like the, I always talk about like being, uh, being down on Devonte Adams, like this time last year, I was like, 
I joke now because everybody hates Devontae Adams, poor guy. But um, back at like this time last year, being one of the few like dissenting opinions, it, it was I was I'm like, those were hard times for the, those few of us, like because everybody else was completely on board. And so it takes a little bit of like, you know, self-assurance and I say borderline arrogance because that's just me um, to stand and take that. I think there's also, like, there have been moments, I will fully admit, like, this time last year, I was not on the Brandon Cooks hype train. I was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't, I mean, he's comping to Steve Smith. That's so insulting to Steve Smith. This kid is, like, not nearly as gritty, blah, blah, blah. And then I sort of, everybody was going against the tide, and I had those moments, that I had that, like, self-doubt. And I was like, well, I guess, like, I guess I'm just, they must see something I'm not seeing. I'm going to go ahead and quiet down and I mean I probably shouldn't admit this but let's be as transparent as possible in an exercise like this right so I was like I'm gonna go I'm gonna die down on the anti Brandon Cooks hate just because I doubted myself and then the season came and I was like Ugh! you know I'm, I'm like watching tape thinking I was right like my assessment of this dude was right and I should have spoken up and now like I can't I told you so because I let myself be quieted and that is more frustrating than being like if, if I had been wrong, then like, eh, I was, you know, the idiot who was wrong. It's worse to be the idiot who was right, but then didn't say anything, you know, and that's such a lesson in going with your gut. And also, guys, it's football. Like, next, there will always be another season. We're not talking about Benghazi or Palestine or any of those other things, right? Like, it's football. If you don't yeah. like Devontae Adams, here's the brilliant thing. You don't have to draft him. It's as simple yeah. as that. Don't take this shit so seriously. I mean, that's that's just what I always tell people in general. And yeah, right. Like it's football, and that's why I always in, I always like kind of get a kick out of people that do take themselves so seriously as like football analysts, like they're uncovering you know some sort of ancient hidden truths or whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, this is like not or like the you know, as, especially working for NFL media, you meet some ex players that are very much like you didn't play the game, you shouldn't talk about it, shouldn't talk about. It. It's like. Mm. Dude, you're not reading hieroglyphics like off a pyramid or whatever. Like this, it's it's football. It's not that hard to understand. Also, what's wrong with a different perspective? Like right. offering a different perspective. If there is an audience who is interested in your point of view, which is like you know adjacent to somebody else's point of view, then there's an audience for it. And go eat it up. Why why shouldn't you take that? I get those tweets all the time. They're like, "What do you know about football? You never played football." Okay. And, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of opinions about like the election and I doubt you ever ran for student council president. So, right. That's what, a great like, point. <laughs> you know? so I don't know. I, I also feel like if you did not play football, then maybe you can come to it with a different perspective that isn't as personal or there isn't a particular bias or anything like that, you know? Yeah. And I think there are definitely things that X players can speak on that I will never be able to speak sure. on, like especially like about you know interactions in the locker room and like the emotional aspect of football, like you know it being like twenty degrees below zero and like having to hit some guy over and over again. Like I would, I would never be able to. And I like I never trivialize football players for doing something that I could just absolutely never do. Like I remember it's some different different points this season. Like especially there was one hit that Tyler Eifert took when he was like catching a touchdown. He got popped right in the back. I was like, if that happened to me, I would turn into dust on the spot. I would. Oh I would, my gosh! I'd be on the side like the train like the trainers be like, you're fine. You can get back in next. He's like, no, 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 just shoot me, just kill me. I, <laughs> put me down like a racehorse. Yeah. Put, put me down. I can't do this. Yeah. So I mean, there's a like. You're right. There's there's a lot of different perspectives, and I probably I probably come at it from a different perspective than what you come at it, and, and several other people. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's like, my job is not to try to be anybody but me. And that those are the people I think that end up breaking through in this business or any business. I mean, like, knowing your voice, knowing I hate using this, but knowing your brand. Um, <laughs> but I think it's more like knowing your voice, knowing who you are, staying true in those convictions, not being on the Brandon Cooks hype train when you don't want to be. Those are the things that resonate with people, having a point of view. If you're wishy-washy and everything is like, you're well, I'm going to play some sport, I'm going to try to get into this thing, then like the entire message gets lost and muddled. And it's not uh, like, I think you and Matthew talked about this on your last podcast, and it was great. He talked about being a good communicator. And I think that part of being a good communicator is knowing who you are, being self-assured to your earlier point, and then being able to convey that. No, and, and knowing that, 
it's okay if you're wrong because you are going to be wrong in this business. You are not going to hit on every start set. You're not going to hit on every prospect. At some point, there's going to be someone on your dynasty team who bottoms out. That's okay too, you know, like, but having, doing the homework, coming up with a narrative, coming up with a, with an idea and knowing that it is your authentic self that is communicating it is what almost always resonates with at least some portion of the community on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Sigmund Bloom always says this and it's, it's about being right and wrong. He's like, you can be right half a season and wrong half a season. And I think Brandon Cooks is actually a really good example of that. Cause, sure. but yeah, I was, I was not on board at all this time last year. And then the first six weeks, you know, I'm marching down, I'm marching down Twitter like, Oh yeah, that's right. Told you. But then he started, has a good second half of the season. Sure. By the way, if you're, if you're not watching, I just did the most stupid looking move ever. When I said that, uh, but anyways, I imagined sorry. you wearing later hosen while you were doing it. Oh God, that is embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah. So like, then he obviously like, and I think that a lot of it still like kind of proved the point on the player, like the Saints, you know, changed his role up. He wasn't like exclusively lining up as like their number one receiver all the time. Other options started to emerge to take away coverage. And then he starts breaking out. And then it's like, oh, well now, Harmon, it looks like you were wrong, you know, like because right. he's starting to produce. And I think that that's actually an interesting point because like, how, like, you know, you mentioned you take a lot of negativity on Twitter and, and like, you know, get into all that. Like, how do you deal with like, you know, quote unquote, being wrong? Well, I don't get negativity for being wrong. I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, like, that's not – I get just as many, like, oh, why didn't you tell me that Arian Foster was going to blow out his Achilles this way? Well, because – He didn't tell I, me. Right. If I knew that, then I'd be a lot richer than I – if I was able to see the future, I promise you I'd be super wealthy, <laughs> you know. Um, but most of the negativity I get is the why aren't you in the kitchen sort of nonsense. Right. Okay. Well, so let's we'll just we'll get into that then. Like, what what is it like? Because this again, talk about a perspective I cannot speak on. Like, what is it like being a you know, being a very successful female in like a, a, a incredibly male dominated industry? So again, this is I feel like this answer is a cop out, but it is if I'm being authentic. Like I could make up some you know Gloria Steinem esque answer, but the answer is because I grew up in a world and with a man who. It wasn't weird to be in sports. Like it was, that was, this was my primary caregiver. And we did all of this boy stuff. I didn't know it was called boy stuff. I didn't know that there was a different, and frankly, nobody gave me slack about it growing up. Like it, it, it just wasn't a weird thing. So when I entered this space, I didn't really know that Neanderthals still roamed the earth. I, I was totally taken aback. And to the guy who said, this is why, why isn't this woman in the kitchen? Because the answer is I can't flip and cook is why I'm not in the kitchen. Like, you've clearly not tasted anything. I, I can make a hell of a drink. I'm a great bartender. Um, th that's from years of being a struggling actress. But, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I do not know how to cook anything. Um, and, and so now, uh, like, they've also evolved those tweets. So there is some of that. The one that gets me the most upset, the one that I have the hardest time swallowing and just brushing off is the one who says that I'm like reading off of a prompter or that somebody's given me this information and I'm just not making my own analysis. That is the one that honestly infuriates me the most because there is no, nobody helping me. <laughs> like, mm. Do you know what I mean? And he would never look at um, you or Michael Fabiano or Brad Evans and say like, they're scripting his stuff. Ever, ever, ever. It would never even occur to that guy to accuse somebody of that. So they don't know that I am sitting in my hovel of a home office. Office like before we logged on, I've been I'm writing this draft series. So I've been watching Dak Prescott tape. Do you know how hard it is to get Dak Prescott tape? Like it, it's not like there's a, a ton of it that aren't just highlight reels because he broke every record that Mississippi State ever put forth. Like there's not a lot of like actual um, varied tape on Dak, Pres Bre Dak Prescott. But I never like I never tweet a photo of myself with my notebook watching tape saying like, "Hey, just watching tape, IG family." That because that's like lame and takes too much time. So I would say that that is the hardest one. Uh, because it it because it um, interrupts or or bumps against my authenticity, which I do take great pride in. So that 
bugs me. Um, otherwise, the other guys, they've evolved to like, I have this guy who like always tweets me about wanting to suck my toes. That's Jeez. the thing. <laughs> like the every week um there's like girl I want to suck your toes like and I can I've given him that voice because of the way he types it out so that guy though I think is like I save his tweets I like uh screen grab them and then look at them when I need a laugh because you know I've never like maybe this is a TMI I've never had my toes sucked sounds sounds like something could I don't know. Sounds like maybe in a mood that might be interesting. So I say yeah, that. I'm sure there are, there, are, there are definitely people out there that enjoy that, and that's that's their thing. I, so, <laughs> I I've never participated in any sort of activity like any toe sucking for you, uh, right? No, no, I've so, never I've never given or 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 received. Received toe sucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, th like those guys, eh, I think it's funny. I mean, it's a lot work. This is probably not the right answer, but the true answer is like, is it undermining and demeaning? Absolutely. Should I have to put up with it? No. But at least they're like kind of favorable. You know, I would hate for somebody to be like, I would never want to suck your toes. You're disgusting. Like that's <laughs> the worst tweet. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's just def it is definitely like a, however you react to it, it's definitely a different experience. Like I can say that. I have uh, gotten zero propositions for any sort of sexual activity in my mentions, <laughs> uh, which is like a little disappointing. Like, come on, there are ladies on Twitter. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, wow, that was bad. Um, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is when like my rawness as a host comes out. Is it like I'll comment on things I just said? So bear with me, people that are somehow listening to this podcast. Uh, but so I kind of I completely lost my train of thought there now. But uh, like. It, it is interesting because it's a very it is a very different experience it's something I, I I'm not familiar with and like it, you definitely it seems like it seems like it would be more difficult for me but I think it does sound like you've kind of gotten used to it or or see like the kind of light in it is that is that the perspective you would want to give off to like if there was like an aspiring writer that was a female like what would be the the one thing that you would say, like, you have to do this or you have to kind of approach it this way. Well, I think it's regardless of gender, you're always going to get bad tweets. Whatever, like, filter yes. your bad tweets, your negative tweets, your demeaning tweets, whatever you want to say, like, whatever filter those come through, you can't pay those attention, right? It's like taking a test and getting, like, a 92% in a test and focusing on the 8% of the questions that you got wrong. You still got an A, but you can't just focus on the, the portion of of the test that you like didn't ace right so think about all of the tweets like yes i i get some some not great tweets but i also get a ton of awesome tweets i get a, a wonderful shocking amount of like accolades and engagement and thank yous and that's the stuff that like makes me excited that's the stuff that i thrive on so in I'm not even going to say I've had a dark moment. I can't say like in dark moments because I frankly haven't had them and that's telling, right? So I look at the good stuff and I think like, awesome, this guy just tweeted me a picture of his fantasy football trophy because he's the champion this year and he's crediting me in part to having won that. That's awesome. Or a girl who's like, um, uh, you know, I had a grand, I tell the story, I had a grandmother not tweet me, but send me an email because she's a grandma. Um, she said <laughs> she had found the X's and Y's podcast or my blog, um, and she had decided to listen to it because it was a woman, and she lived far away from her grandson, who was very interested in fantasy sports, and she used my content as a tool to learn and played with him the entire season. She didn't win. She didn't care about winning, but it was a way for she and her grandson to engage and better the relationship. I mean, and that like gives me chills, nor like that's cool stuff. Like I care much more about hearing from this, you know, 60 plus year old woman who is listening to my gibberish so that she can play fantasy football and have a relationship with her grandson who lives states away. That's the, that give me a million suck your toes tweets for one of those. And they're not even comparable, you know? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that is, that is a really cool story. That's way cooler than anything I've ever gotten I've gotten a lot of cool stuff but that's awesome and I think that I, I do think that like you're you know I talk about it a lot like and, and how it applies to football but like with also with real life and this is an application more towards real life like but it's your negativity bias and I think that there are a lot of mm. analysts out there that focus on that negative and I think that creates 
the opportunity for people to be more negative towards you. If like, you know, I, like, I remember talking about this on several episodes before, but like, you know, if you get like a lot of nasty tweets and then, you know, you kind of give a ton of pushback to that, or like you quote tweet, like someone telling you to, you know, screw off or whatever, like, and you're like, Oh, or, you know, you draw some attention to it. I think that that creates more negativity. It's, it, it just, you're right. Like I, I, that's what, that's my approach to it too, is, just focus on like the overwhelmingly more positive interactions than I've been focusing on like that, you know, 8% negative or something like that, which is really, that's even being generous towards it. <laughs> well, sometimes I would say that like you have to pick and choose your battle. So if you're not someone who normally, uh, you know, retweets with the quote tweet, your negative interactions. And then once, like there was a guy, I think it was mid season. So, you know, like week 10, week 11, like that, that's the grind of the season. That's like, oh my <laughs> God, <not> done. <laughs> right. you got to get to thanks. Cause once you get to Thanksgiving, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but that couple of weeks before Thanksgiving, um, it is, it's a little bit rough. Um, and I, at that point in the season, there was a guy who tweeted me and he said, I'll never take advice from a woman. And I was like, you know what? You caught me on a bad day. I'm going to quote. Mm -hmm. I never do this, but I'm going to quote tweet it, tweet it. And I wrote, I'll alert the press. And I would say that dude got buried. Like he yeah. just like all of these people came through the woodwork being like, are you kidding? This woman just won me X amount on daily because she her sleeper this week was blah, blah, blah. Like you don't know. What. And so like that was an instance where I could say like that felt awesome because I didn't have to fight any battles like that dude got one favorite and then totally buried and then like I don't know an hour later was like I'm just kidding you know that was a joke I love you girl and I was yeah. like okay so sometimes there can be a lesson in there um, but I will also say if people are listening to this because they're hoping to break into the space something not to do there is like a secret etiquette so Matt tell me if you agree with this but like when someone asks you a start sit question for example and says I don't know do I start Alfred Morris or Matt Jones this week that was something that happened a lot last season, right? And then you are thinking, you hopeful fantasy prognosticator, are thinking that you're going to engage with someone who's maybe more established in the space. But you answer the question for, like, do you know when someone else answers the question? Like, at mm -hmm. football fan tweets, at Mark, Matt Harmon, do I start Alfred Morris or Matt Jones this week? And then person over here, in this like like answers you definitely start Alfred Morris before Matt Harmon has had a chance to reply yeah I don't like that like and then also if I don't agree I always feel awkward because I'm like mm, actually Alf like he's hurt right now and I feel like Matt Jones has your has the best shot of I don't know passing the goal line whatever and then I don't know. So I feel like sometimes people are doing that in the hopes to engage, but it's like toe stepping a little bit. I then maybe that sounds snotty on my half, but I feel on my behalf, but I feel like that's there's an etiquette to that. It is a little weird. And I mean, perhaps like some people come at it with the perspective of like, yeah, maybe they nor and normally like because I've noticed that too, and I've never actually talked about that because I've noticed it and it is always kind of weird and then I always feel obligated like now I have to give my answer in order to be like because I think some yes. people do I think some people do it because you know and this sounds really stupid like, like they you, you know they either view like oh he, you know the Harmon works for NFL he's not going to reply to everybody which is complete bullshit thanks but I, I, answer I, a ton. Yeah, I answer more questions like I answer more questions than I've ever wanted to ever. So, so uh, I mean, I try my best, but you know, of course you miss some people and like, you know, you're not on, tw like I'm on Twitter probably as much as humanly possible. And there's still some things I'm not going to see. And like, so maybe people come at it from the perspective of like, Oh, I'm going to answer because you know, Matt's either thinks he's too good or he's too busy to answer. So, but also I do think it's kind of like trying to get people to follow you. Maybe I don't right, know. It's, that it's, you if that's your motivation, everybody. yeah, if that's your motivation, that is really weird. Like trolling through another uh, another analyst man mentions that are like, you know, that they're, they're, they're bigger than yours and then answering questions. I feel like that's kind of a weird thing to do. Or just okay. answer it without also including my or your handle on the reply. Yeah, yeah just never – I mean, everything is like success is like built off relationships and like knowing other people and, and doing that whole thing. But it's also like you never want to try to like step on somebody in order to in order yes. to boost yourself up. 
yeah. guess is yeah, that's a really important uh, thing. I thank you for bringing that up. I, that's something I never would have even thought to talk about, but that is definitely important because it is a turn like it's it's a turn off for me. Like when I see somebody do that, I'm kind of weirded out by it. Like. Well, it, and I've had someone do it a couple of times, and then also their advice was bad. Like, like the <laughs> sort of the like, do I start Jeremy Hill or Gio Bernard? And the answers were like, well, in PPR, start Gio, and in standard, start Hill. And I'm like, oh, that's just that was very bad yeah. advice. Don't do that. But then that person has like sent me not DMs because I don't follow them back, but like sent me messages saying, "Hey, will you read my stuff?" And I'm like, well, no, I'm not in sent. You just fought with me publicly like I'm not incentivized yeah. to like read your stuff and I'm busy and it's week 10 so do you really think like I'm gonna you know who's actually excellent Mike Taglieri I don't know if you've ever he is someone who I saw at the FSTA in January I had no idea who this kid was didn't know he came up to me said hi I'm Mike I'm from Chicago as well um I love your work I just want to say hi and I was like cool and hi great to meet you we started chatting he knew a ton he said, you know, if you have a chance, can you check out my site? I sure did because he was wonderful. And then I had him on the X's and Y's as a guest on my own podcast like two weeks later. But that was someone who was just so genuine and sweet and then also had great work to back it up. That's the other thing. If your work isn't um, fine-tuned enough, don't show it to people too early. Yeah. That's that's definitely true. And actually, Mike, I think that's a good person to bring up. Like he listened to the podcast, like asked like if it was OK, if you could email me and like, you know, we talked a little bit about that. And then like, obviously, like you know, I read his work and then I followed him like and that's a good yeah. I mean, that's just a genuine way to like make connections, not like don't go into it with a motivation of like, yeah. And for sure, I get a lot of tweets like asking people asking me to read stuff and like I don't do it as much as I would like to like sometimes I'll, I'll like the tweet and like if I go back and think about it but like yeah I mean it's it's hard like the worst thing and there was some blog that was that I actually had to like mute or block or something because it was so obnoxious like anything I was saying they would like reply to that and then like drop a link and mm -hmm. it was it that's like I'm never going I'm never going to read your because it's not human like you want yeah. to be interacted with on a human level and you also hope that like someone who's trying to get you to read their stuff isn't doing it in week 10 that they have enough knowledge of the flow yeah. of the season that they will wait until I don't know February 2nd <laughs> yeah the off season is a great time and I definitely read more like I just yeah. read more in general in the off season like in season I'm so focused on like grinding through my own content and stuff like that so it's definitely important to try to build those relationships. And there are several, like, you know, there are several guys that like that I've met on, met on Twitter that have, you know, even prior to this podcast that have like asked for my help and I've, I've done my best. Like, especially if you, especially if you email me, that's a better way to do it than to just like drop a link in a tweet or whatever. Like I'm more likely to respond to it probably two weeks later. Cause that's just how I do things. Um, and that, like, but just don't go into the interaction, like with an agenda. I mean, that's the, that's the worst. Like, I don't know. And I mean, that's, and I say that, I say that from my own personal experience, not like that I'm trying to dictate how people should interact with me, but that's how I went when I was like two years ago before I was anything, you know, I was just like, I just hope people like are, you know, just, I'm just trying to just talk to people, you know, trying right. to share my opinion. Same, same. You can feel when you're being networked with. Yes. And I don't like that because I don't like to network. I don't network as a person. Like I don't, I'm not, that's not what I'm good at. Like, I'm just good at just being me and just like talking to people. <laughs> and if that turns into something like an opportunity where I've networked, that's fine. But yeah, no, I'm not a big, like, I'm not a big connections maker. Or, you know, I don't like, I'm not, I'm not LinkedIn spoke, spokesman, I guess you would say. <laughs> LinkedIn, LinkedIn's terrible. I hate that website with a burning fiery passion. But uh, anyway, so kind of, kind of coming, circling back a little bit to your story here, Liz, how did you go from being like a part-time actress, blogger, doing your own podcast, and now like you work full-time for Yahoo. Like, How did that end up happening? Um, so, goodness. Well, so, like I said, every year I would just expand whatever I my content, like whether that meant a podcast, so, you know, guesting on a podcast, then having my own podcast. The year after that, I was like, you know what, I think I should do some video. I think video is like, was vlogs, vlogs were becoming a thing, and so I taught myself how to read off of a teleprompter and just bought the app on my iPad and there was this place in Texas that makes like 
jerry-rigged teleprompters for like 200 bucks and so I put this thing up and would write my own copy and started adding it to the fantasyfootballgirl.com twice a week I started doing these video segments um and then at that point I felt like my presence in the space was growing enough that I start I also said yes to everything any podcast no matter how bad no matter how small I said yes to everything you want to come on my show my awful I can't even hear half the audio show. I sure do because it's practice. Yeah. You always say yes to the meeting until you are in a until you are too busy to say yes. Like I will still say yes to almost everything unless I'm working at the time or have a like a time conflict. Um, so I I just did everything and then slowly like Sirius XM started asking me to come on. Um, Bob Harris of Football Diehards asked me to come on his show. Nando Defino asked me to come on his show, and I was. On Nando's show on Sirius XM and Dr. Roto, who I adore, he is with Scout Fantasy. He heard me and reached out and said, oh, my gosh, like, how do I not know you? And I was like, I don't know. I don't <laughs> you know. Like, I'm here. I'm existing. Um, and he introduced me to people at Scout. And Scout gave me my first season-long job. And it was a grind. And I have never worked so long and I not because the assignments were so long but because I just had never done it full time like there's a learning curve and it took me so much longer to crank out a thousand word article in the beginning than it does now there's just a flow and you're like honing a new muscle um and so I had that job and then um Yahoo approached me and the timing was wonderful and i have always played all of my fantasy football on Yahoo. I'd been friends with Andy Barron's for years. He had invited me into a pro-am league a couple of years before, and I'd done a couple of writing assignments um, through him on the site. So there's a familiarity there, and I'd been um, staying in touch with him. And So I'm in LA, and Yahoo is based here. So when they would fly in, um, we'd all have drinks together, or Andy, who's based in Chicago, like, I mean, it was like that same relationship building, staying in touch, um, having it, like, we're friends, we are genuinely friends, so when we were in town, um, we'd see each other, and then, you know, Yahoo is in a position to add someone, and I got the job, and I've been thrilled to be there, um, I work with the best people in the world, I mean, sorry, you don't work there too, because you were one great person. Um, offense taken. Um, but I feel like I work with the best people in the world, and it's really been an astonishing dream come true. But I think it it happened because I didn't stop creating my own content. I didn't. I also wasn't necessarily looking. Like, I can't say it wasn't a dream that come true, but I wasn't like, I, every move wasn't like calculated. I wasn't like, ooh, I'm going to write this article and so-and-so is going to see it. I was just saying yes to everything and knowing that if my work was good and I was authentic and the place that I was speaking from and storytelling from was organic, if I threw all of that out into the ether, somebody would um, recognize it and find it as interesting as I did. So I just kept going in, you know, like, I will say this just piece of it because I know you and um, Matthew talked a lot about entertainment and I was I was working in entertainment. I had a after a while, like I had a pilot for ABC and have been on 24 and Scandal and a lot of television shows and was doing pretty well. Uh, I was eventually able to afford cable television. Um, <laughs> and um, there was a moment that I and at the same time was doing the blog stuff, but the blog stuff was more like hobbies, was more fun, was more because it was mine and no one got to like have an opinion about it or I, nobody gave me notes on it. It was just for me. And I think that because it was just for me, it read really naturally. Um, and there was an obvious joy in it. Um, and there was a certain point that I had booked this little thing through NFL media and the NFL was hosting um, the Players Union, I think it's called, I don't know the official name of it, but they were hosting the, the NFL PA was hosting a, um, some, it's called, um, it was called the Hollywood Boot Camp, the NFL Hollywood Boot Camp, and it was on the Universal lot, and it was for players who were, 
you know, maybe towards the end of their players looking to transition from the NFL into some other industry. And there were some who wanted to go into entertainment. Robert Townsend was the director of the whole thing, the, you know, the mentor for it. And Derek Hagan was there and Jarek Odrick was there. And I booked this little because it's the, at Universal Studios is like 20, 15 minutes from my house. I booked this little featurette. I made this deal. I got the credentials and I said, okay, like I'm going to interview these people and I'm going to do this and it'll be great. And the NFL was thrilled with it. I happened to be six months pregnant at the time. Oh, wow. um, my son is two months old. So you say, oh, wow. So this is interesting. Okay. So I was six months pregnant time. It didn't occur. Like I felt great. I was working out. I was clearly pregnant, but that didn't affect who I was or my neck up abilities or frankly, my right. neck down abilities. Right. And the players loved that I was pregnant. They loved that I was having a boy. They loved that I was talking X's and O's with them and talking about the entertainment industry, which they like aspired to be in. And the whole thing was a wonderful, wonderful experience. They asked if they could like touch my tummy and feel the baby kick and the whole thing. The very next day, like less than 24 hours later, I was going in to test for a giant pilot for a network. Um, and I had already booked a pilot on this network, though the pilot didn't go. And I booked the pilot the year before. Um, and we had gotten very close to going and it was a wonderful experience, but at last we didn't go and that was pretty heartbreaking. But Anyway, a year later, I'm testing for another pilot. They're down to like the last three people for this role. My manager has told all of these people that I'm pregnant. They hired me a year ago, so they know what I look like not pregnant. And I walk in, and one of the suits says, oh, you're pregnant. And I was like, uh, yeah, six months. I'm, I'm pretty pregnant. <laughs> um, and they were like, huh. And I was like, uh, is that a problem? Well, it's an obstacle. Oh, geez. Okay. So I then did my audition, which was not fantastic at that point because I was so mad. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, we've been through all of this. I'm finally here. I'm testing. The casting director knows that I'm pregnant. My manager has communicated to everyone that I'm pregnant. My due date is this. We're not going to shoot until that. Like, it's not an issue. And I left that and thought about these two antithetical experiences that occurred 24 hours apart and how the football experience was wonderful and inviting and nobody gave a crap that I was – like I was a human being. And the entertainment one was so – just a completely paradoxical to that. And so I thought like I'm tired of trying to be a member of a club that is lukewarm about having me. And I think that that was the instance that I was like, screw this. I I don't, I don't even want to do this anymore. And I just, at six months pregnant, which it would be weird, you think, because like I'm a woman in this male dominant space and it was six months pregnant that I was like, I'm all in on football. I can't deal with this. I would rather hang out with a bunch of like NFL professional athletes than like snooty television executives who have a problem with me growing a child in me. So that it was, and it was, that was, I think my light bulb moment to focus yeah. on. Yeah. Just football. That's a that's a really good story, and like uh, that's that's pretty. It's pretty crazy that the two like were completely different in responding that way, and like and just to, like about like one was on Tuesday, one was on Wednesday. You know. Yeah. Sometimes life really does, and I mean, this has definitely been my experience. Like, you know, like you put good things out into the universe, and like good thing, like the universe will communicate back to you. Like you know, and whether that is you know whatever your faith or belief system is, like you know, you can apply it to that as well. Like, I think that it's just, that's just the way life goes. And, and that is re a really good illustration of that. Like, I know sometimes like things like just to come clear in, in a moment that you wouldn't expect that it, it just happens. And I know that's just the way it's been for me. And kind of interestingly in your experience, that seems like it's a little bit different from mine and others that have been on the podcast so far. Like, it seems like things just kind of like, you know, people approached you or like things kind of like that's sort of it's a little bit different from what other people have communicated. So that's interesting, too, that like sometimes things just happen. Or well, I, I also I, think that knowing when like you have to ride the horse in the direction it's going. Yeah. And that is some of the best career advice. I was so busy pounding the pavement and acting, trying to get these people to like trying to get to the next level to get this engine to turn over. And in the meantime, I wasn't taking note of all of the good stuff that was occurring in the football space. And, you know, it also took like me 
having to switch gears and then say like, okay, I'm going to take all of my knowledge of entertainment and put it towards football mm -hmm. and then effectively network and write these articles on a real regular basis. And when free agency hits, make sure that my take, my independent blog take is on time with the four letter networks and yahoos so that it doesn't come too late after like i have to make this my priority and i think that's really tough if you have a day job but you have to like if you're an independent entity just starting out you have to make sure that your timeline that your free agency article isn't posting now because it's over right. Yeah. right like you have got to be clear your schedule don't work your shift I don't take night school, whatever that day. And on Wednesday, when everyone else is sitting by their computers, when you and me and everybody else in the industry who's getting paid to do it is sitting by their computer waiting to hear whether, I don't know, Jimmy Graham goes to Seattle, whatever happens, you know, like you got to be there to react immediately because that's how you're going to get noticed. If you just write what everybody else has written in a regurgitated way, you're going to get looked over. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely true. Like, yeah, I think when I first decided, like, okay, maybe I'm actually going to try to make this like my job. Maybe like I'll like I have that goal. Like, just the original thought. My first thing was like, I'm going to treat it like it already is my yep. job. Like, I'm gonna, you know, like I I remember actually just came up on my Facebook uh, timeline like a, a little bit after like I uh, I started at NFL like. I, it was a picture that I posted on Facebook from like two years ago, working my first job out of college. Like, and I worked night shifts at this group home and I would like bring my laptop, my iPad and like chart players and watch film and like write, write articles like at night when I was working, you know, I was working, but really there wasn't how much to do it on the night shifts and everything. So, and I remember all the post was like, this is, you know, this is like my fake work at my real work. And uh, like two years later, now my, my fake work, is my real work now right. and so and that was but that was the impetus and i think like what you were just communicating too is like even if it's not your job like you the best bet to someday turn it into your job is like to, to treat it like it already is like you know get it out there like it like get the information out there on time you know be dedicated make sacrifices in your in your personal life even yeah. make huge sacrifices don't think you're owed them and I mean, I remember after my son, my son was born June 27, 2013, football season started immediately, like immediately oh, thereafter. And I was, I did radio, um, radio spots on Sirius XM, had to pull over on the 405 because he was screaming and I had to nurse while live on radio. That was my experience. Like I, w I also wasn't ashamed of it. I remember doing yeah. so many podcasts with like, bouncing on a ball with him in front of me and my finger in like a pacifier, please, like hoping that he wouldn't cry and do it, but still saying yes to everything. Would I have liked to have been like, hey, I have like a six week old. I can't really do this, but I did it. Like, and, and, and also I wasn't like, don't be ashamed of the fact that you're at some night job at a group home and you've got your gear with you. Don't be ashamed of the fact that like you've got a toddler running around like that is your experience. And if anything, it makes it much more relatable and interesting and rich to the yes. audience that you're like, don't hide it and be yeah. super like be honest about the fact that like you are making sacrifices because that is a thousand times more relatable to people listening than you like being in some glistening, perfect, uh, studio audience that smells like, you know, new furniture. Like that's not at all relatable. So just be who you are and don't have any like shame in it. Just make those sacrifices. Be honest about the sacrifices you're making. And I promise it'll resonate. I can't tell you how, like how many times I've just been like, well, this is what I have to, like, this is how my life is. So this is what I'm going to do. But I know that my work and my analysis is on point. So if there's a kid crying behind it, you just have to deal with it. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And and like sharing that through your, you know, on Twitter, or, you know, in podcasts or something like that, like it definitely makes you more relatable. And like people want to relate yes. to analysts. Like they don't like, and I can, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but there are plenty of people out there that like come from their ivory tower and like, you know, yes. they, yeah, and it's not, it's disgusting and it's not relatable. And like they might be successful and they might hold a job in the industry for a long time, but you build a much better relationship with your audience. And that also like, in, it ingratiates you positively. And like, then you won't get so much negativity when you don't come off. Like if you miss on something, you know, yep. you get a wrong call, people won't be such an ass to you. <laughs> like, because you know, you're relatable and it, it, 
that sharing that struggle, it's, it's just real, like just be a real right. person. There's a difference between sharing your struggle and making excuses. But if you're still doing oh, yeah. the work and your work is, you know, textured in some way because of your 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 circumstances, that's cool. Don't make excuses. Oh my God, I'm so tired and I've got a sinus infection and it's week seven. Yeah. Nobody cares about that. Like you have a dream job to stop whining. Yeah, definitely you know? nobody, definitely nobody cares. And I think I joked about that with uh, Franchise two podcasts ago that like some of the things that like I find myself complaining about my job now, like, you know, because it, it's a job, like you're gonna complain about your job, even if it is your dream job. Like, I like to like if I was if, if Matt Harmon was else to say this again, I said it on that podcast, but if like Matt Harmon today was to complain to Matt Harmon two years ago about his current job problems, like I would slap right. myself in the face. <laughs> um, but I kind of one thing you did mention there, and like I just kind of want to circle back, uh, circle back to it was like just to tell a little story about myself, like when you said like don't be ashamed of like you know have like all the effort and like sometimes what people will, people will not understand like people in your personal life aren't going to understand it like I, one of my my good friend at the time when I was like one of my only good friends that was living in the same place as me during that time when I had that night job like I could always, like he was you know always like yeah dude backyard banter that's real cool like you're doing your website thing but you can always tell like people are like why don't you just come out tonight? Like, why don't you just like, you do this, you're not writing this article for anybody. Like, you know, why don't you just come out and like get drunk with us tonight or whatever. And I turned on down plenty of opportunities to be social like that in order to, to make those sacrifices. And it was really funny because I ended up to like, when I got my job at NFL, he was one of the first people I told. He was like, he's like, damn, dude, I never, he's like, I never expected you to actually make it work. But it, right. that, you know, that happens. And so it feels good when you come back around and like, you make those sacrifices, like ultimately, I promise it will eventually be worth it. But um, Liz, this has been great. I always kind of give the guests like one last opportunity before we get out of here to like take the floor after I, before I yank it out from under you. If there's any other things you want to kind of convey to the audience, like and to, to aspiring writers or anybody listening, you know, floor is yours. I mean, I would just want to say again, I think something that we didn't fully hit on just talked in passing was the the idea that you have to ride the horse in the direction it's going and so if there are things that you are if if fantasy sports is like the dream you told yourself when you were a 14 year old boy but like maybe you have this chess business that's like really ex like it's okay if this ends up being a hobby and not your career also if you feel like Matt, you talked about how it potentially saved your life. And I, I am so much happier now not being, and I get told all the time, like, I can't believe that you were on a pilot. Like, you were so close to being on, like, an ABC sitcom. Like, why would you give that up? Because it stopped making me happy. Because the work I was doing wasn't joyful, and that was reflecting in my bookings. If I'm being totally honest, like, I'm not going to blame the, the industry. I'm not jaded on the entertainment industry. My work wasn't joyful because I was so done with the rat race, right? My work in football is joyful, and, I, and, I, and it remains joyful, and I am so much happier. Am I as famous, in quote? Do I make as much money? All of that is, like, questionable, but I am happy, and I think that all of that if you will, energetic mem momentum propelled me forward. And I would argue that things didn't just happen, but they were all sort of happening. And I was able to identify that this is happening. Like I said yes to everything. And so I can be the overnight success that took a blog in 2009. And then like, you know, 2015, everyone's like, oh my God, who is this girl? But they didn't see the, you know, six years of me trucking along and writing articles about, oh my goodness, Rob Hausler. So, <laughs> so I would say if there is joy in your work and you are doing it for totally unselfish, um, but like emotionally happy, resonating reasons, then keep doing it. Say yes to everything. Put, put stuff out there. Don't do the bare minimum. Do the absolute maximum and someone will recognize your work. Get better. Stay hungry. And most of all, stay grateful because if you are grateful every day for even whatever it is that happened that day, more and more the gratitude and like good things and positive energy will grow. Or maybe that's a little bit woo-woo, but... I found that it's worked out pretty well for me. I, I mean, I completely agree with that. You know, being being happy in what you do is is incredibly important. And if you're not like, if you are 
like, and this is important too. And I think we talked about this a lot with Eric Stoner on his episode. Like if you find that doing this is like, if you, you know, you think like my dream is football, it's working football, but you're doing it and it's like sucking the joy out of you. Don't, yes. That's your answer. It. That's yeah. your answer. Like right. it's okay to be a landscape artist or something else instead. That is your answer. A hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. And like, I'm, you know, I always say this, like I, I tell people a lot, like, I don't think that my, you know, my destiny or my story is completely written yet. And if five years, like, I don't like doing things in football anymore, then I won't do things in football anymore. I'm not just going to stick around because it's everybody's dream or whatever, but that probably won't happen. So don't think you're rid of me just yet. But uh, Liz, I really appreciate you coming on today. This was absolutely fantastic. Uh, make sure you're keeping up with all of Liz's work at, at Yahoo and everything. She's doing a great job there. And um, as for everybody that listened today, uh, if this was your first show, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please subscribe to the show on iTunes, leave ratings, reviews. That stuff really helps uh, me know what to make better about the podcast and also just helps us spread the word about this bad boy because I'm really enjoying it and I hope you guys are too. And so thank you everybody for listening today and I hope you learned something.